panelists and our audience of just a few things. As this is a virtual forum, and many of us have done these by many of them by now, but I kindly seek your compliance with the usual Zoom etiquette uh, for smooth functioning of the event. So speakers and panelists, please always mute your microphone when not speaking. For our audience, in order for you to see the speaker in full screen, please remember to select speaker view instead of gallery view. That's in the upper right corner of your Zoom screen. The Secretariat will be spotlighting the speakers so you'll see everything uh, in, in the proper order. And finally, as this is a webinar format, the chat function has been switched off. But if you have any questions for our panelists, you can send them along in the Q&A function and we have colleagues who are monitoring that. Distinguished guest panelists and all participants, once again, a very warm welcome to all of you if, to the presentation of the Asia and Pacific Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition for 2022. This is a joint flagship report and it's published by the Regional Offices of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, the World Food Program, WFP, and the World Health Organization, WHO. Well, this is the fifth annual report on the region's progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, SDG 2 on ending hunger, and also the World Health As Assembly's 2030 targets on food security and nutrition in Asia and the Pacific. This latest report focuses particular attention on urban food security and nutrition, in this, the world's most populous and fastest growing region. Following a presentation of the report's key findings, there will be a discussion featuring a lineup of dis distinguished panelists. But to begin the event today, may I now invite Mr. Jong Jin Kim, the Assistant Director General and FAO Regional Representative to share his opening remarks. Mr. Kim, please. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Excellencies, Regional Directors of UNICEF, WFP and the WHO, distinguished panelists and ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our four United Nations specialized agencies, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the joint launch of Asia Pacific Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition 2022. While we look to year 2023 as being a year when the world and the Asia Pacific in particular will get back fully recovered after nearly three years of pandemic linked restrictions or constraints, it is difficult to escape from the sense of deja vu about food insecurity and malnutrition. I regret to say that the picture in Asia and the Pacific continues to deteriorate. This is the fifth year when FAO, UNICEF, WRP, and WHO have collaborated to produce this flagship report and the numbers of the malnourished do not make for encouraging reading. Soon after the SDGs were declared in 2015, we were stalling in our progress in the fight against hunger. We then started to regress, going off track towards achieving SDG 2, the zero hunger target. And now we look like to completely lose our way unless urgent systemic multi-sectoral actions are taken. Today, we'll hear from the authors of the report. So I will not go into the details of the report itself. You will have the opportunity to see the highlights today and then study the report yourself soon. As Asia and the Pacific is the world's most populous region, the numbers involved are very big. Nearly 400 million people are malnourished. Slightly over a billion are food insecure. And almost 2 billion cannot afford a healthy diet. This region has the highest level 
of stunting and wasting among children under five. We have made some progress on one indicator. That is just about the only good news. Let me also add that the numbers in this report do not capture the impacts of 5F crisis have had on hunger and poverty. As the data in this report precedes the war between Russia and Ukraine. But we'll include that in the report this year, 2023. One of the key factors is the rapidly increasing cost of healthy diet. This region at the maximum rise. It is indeed ironic that a healthy diet in the world's fastest growing economic region, Asia Pacific, and the largest producer of staple food and key commodities, this region, is unaffordable for so many on average. The cost is almost four US dollars per person per day. Ladies and gentlemen, this picture is not the root causes of increasing hunger and malnutrition, but it is a symptom of the deeper problem. Our current food systems and the policies driving them are not fit to reduce hunger and promote nutrition, and they need to be overhauled. This year's joint report dives deep into the urban food security and nutrition from very obvious region. This region is urbanizing very rapidly. Nearly 55% of the population is expected to reside in urban areas by 2030. And that there are already at least 18 mega cities with a population of 10 million or more. So it is reasonable to say that leading up to 2030, the achievements of SDG2 will be determined by the progress achieved in the urban area. Urban areas have their own set of challenges, including food supply chains, housing, sanitation, health facilities, education, employment, waste management, and a host of other factors that affect food security and nutrition. For, uh, for too long, urban development has been associated only with the development of physical infrastructure and the civic amenities. But food has now become a part of that process. And we are now working in several countries to develop their urban food agenda. Over the last three years in particular, cities have been under immense pressure to ensure adequate food at affordable prices to everyone. The pandemic may be receding, but the 5F crisis is already having a serious negative effect on food price, livelihood, and consequently healthy diets. There are encouraging developments as well. Some cities have rolled out many interesting nutrition in interventions in a customized and con contextualized way, and these are covered in this report. Challenges such as these are also bring opportunities. And world leaders have recognized that they cannot be tackled piecemeal. The UN Food System Summit and the Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2021 placed the food at the center of the global development agenda. In summary, it is not just about providing enough food. It needs to be nutritious, produced with the optimal use of natural resources, accessible and affordable to all, and to assure livelihood to those who are bringing us our next meal. That is the core of the principle of agri-food system transformation. 
and leaving no one behind. All of you watching today have signed up for it, whether you are from the government, public sector, the private sector, academia, or civil society. We hope that this report will inform better policies, sustainable actions by all of you. Our organizations will support you all the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, for those uh, insightful remarks, which set the tone for the presentation of the SOFI report today. Well, as mentioned already, the Asia and Pacific Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition is published as a joint effort by four UN agencies. It reflects and is indeed emblematic of our shared values and strong partnership to help our member nations achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and particularly SDG2 to end hunger in all its forms. Now to officially present the findings of this report, I invite Mr. Sridhar Dharmapuri, Senior Food Safety and Nutrition Officer at the FAO Regional Office to take the floor. Mr. Dharmapuri will be presenting the report on behalf of all four UN agencies. Mr. Dharmapuri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan. Good morning to everyone from Bangkok and good day to all of you, wherever you are. Thank you all for joining in many numbers today. And this is the level of interest that we have been able to generate in this report, because clearly this is a work which is part of the mandate of all the four agencies who are involved here today. And it presents a very important picture as we go forward and we try to achieve the SDGs by 2030. So we will just give you a brief overview of what's in the report give you some of the highlights uh, which we are presenting today. The full report will soon be available online. But let me first start off by acknowledging my colleagues from the other agencies, Roland Kupka from UNICEF, uh, Anusara Singh Kumar Wong from the World Food Program, and Julia Antoro and Angela De Silva from the World Health Organization. Thank you for collaborating with us and bringing out this important report which will hopefully inform all the policymakers, governments, and all the, and the civil society in this region on what are the key priorities going forward in achieving food security and nutrition, or in other words, ending hunger by the year 2030. So um, just to give you a brief idea of what's in the report, the key messages are as follows. Overall hunger in the Asia Pacific region rose further in 2021. We have followed this trajectory for quite a few years now. This report is the fifth joint report by all four agencies. And we have seen how the situation continues to deteriorate since 2015 when the SDGs were actually announced. We have 85 million more hungry people since 2019 which was before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And over the last two years, so 2020 and 2021, we've actually added 40 million more per year to the number of the undernourished. We also have more than a billion people who are moderately or severely food insecure. So it's not good enough just to think that we, it's not uh, that we do have only about 50% of the food, food insecure people in the globe here, but the numbers are much more bigger than what we are actually talking about. Second, this region is not on track to achieve the SDGs or the global nutrition targets, which are set under the World Health Assembly. The progress has been made only in one indicator, which is the prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding. Now that's encouraging in a, uh, definitely, but in all the others such as stunting, wasting, childhood overweight and adult obesity, and as well as anemia and women, we are falling behind and we're actually moving in the wrong direction. There is some amount of decent progress made in the case of low birth weight of children. Importantly, um, what Mr. Kim also pointed out, almost 1.9 billion cannot afford a healthy diet. And the healthy diet in this region costs almost $4 a day per person, which is a huge amount of, uh, of income which goes into 
so in supporting healthy diets for families. And you can imagine this is quite ironical in a region which otherwise counts among its countries the highest producers of key commodities, rice, fish, pork, pulses, millets, milk, and many others. And yet we fail to provide sufficient food or nutritious food to all the citizens living in this region. So that's the larger problem, that the problem that the agri-food systems that we have do not provide sufficient nutritious food to all the citizens living in this region. So if you go deeper into this report, you will actually see that, uh, just give me a minute. Look at the trend over the last, since the beginning of this century. So effectively from the year 2000, the numbers of the malnourished have actually begun to steadily decline. And that is, uh, that you can see in the, year, in the orange curve, the purple line is for the rest of the world, for the whole world. And the, and the red line on top is actually the numbers in millions. So these numbers began to decrease in the early part of this century. And they did actually continue up to around 2015, 2016. And that was, those were the times when the economic growth was very strong. So all the economies were growing well. We had high rates of GDP growth. Let's not forget the Asia Pacific region is the economic engine of the world and has been there for some time. So during those times, the percentage of undernourishment actually began to degree. So it was about, uh, it went down, it's about 9% now, but it came down from 14% in the beginning of the century. But in the last few years, it has again begun to rise. And somewhat that coincides also with soon after the SDGs were announced. So, and then of course, there has been a steep increase in the last two years during the pandemic. And this again goes to show that during good times, we do well in terms of reducing the percentage of undernourishment. But when we are challenged as it happened over the last couple of years, our food systems are not resilient enough and shock resistant enough to continue the progress. And you will see this is reflected in the hardcore numbers as well. Of the nearly 400 million who are undernourished here, the maximum are in Southern Asia around 330 million. There was a small dip. If you look at the table, the numbers will be a little small, but you will have the opportunity to go through the whole report. There was a small dip uh, leading up to 29 in 2015 and leading up to 2019, but then it began to rise again. So some of these increases precede the pandemic. So the problems that are there in ensuring um, the ending of hunger and malnutrition are systemic and they've existed before the pandemic actually took hold. And of course, now we also have the crisis which has been brought on because of the war between Russia and Ukraine. But just important always to understand the problems are systemic and they have been there right from three or four years ago. At the same time, Southeastern Asia, which has seemed to be progressing well up to 2019, is also now showing an uptick in the numbers of the malnourished. The other part of malnourishment is moderate or severe food insecurity. So moderate food insecurity means that people or households at certain times in the year have not been able to buy enough food or have had to make decisions because of constrained budgets. And severe food insecurity refers to long periods of people or families going without food because they have not been able to afford it. That number is now one more than a billion. And this is an increase of over 344 million in over the last eight years. And of this number, nearly 460 million are severely food insecure. And that's a massive increase since 2014, almost 60%. So this is a serious sign that we are not only backsliding from the SDG targets, but we are actually seriously off track. Let's also just keep in mind, we are halfway. Uh, it's 2022 has passed. So we are like exactly halfway between the time the SDGs were announced and we are set to achieve, we are supposed to achieve by 2030. So we are seriously off track in achieving any of these targets. Likewise, for stunting, and here we're talking of low height for age for children under five years of age. The, this region has the highest number in terms, we have 23% of children or 75 million of them who are stunted. 
And you can again see that Southern Asia has the maximum. It's uh, actually Oceania has the maximum at about 41% and Southern Asia at 30%. 10 countries have a very high prevalence, so above 30%, that's by WHO criteria. And another eight have a very high prevalence of 20 to 30%. So overall, 18 countries in the region have a high prevalence, at least, of stunting. And this, again, causes, causes problems that low growth leads to lesser cognitive ability that then affects the productivity of the population as and when these children grow up and become adults and want to contribute to the economy. So we are not, this particular figure is not only looking at the present, we're also looking at some part of the future, which we need to improve. If you look at wasting, which is on low weight for height, almost 10% of children under five in this region are wasted. And the graph or the figure on the right actually tells you the story that it's, it's common across all regions, except for uh, Eastern, Eastern Asia, it's much lesser, but definitely Southern Asia, Southeastern Asia and parts of Oceania, these numbers are severely uh, high. And again, a reason to start thinking about healthy diets and how agri-food systems need to be reshaped and reimagined to ensure that children are not stunted or wasted in the road ahead. Paradoxically, while we speak of child stunting, we also speak of child wasting, we are also talking of child overweight. And this region is no exception to the global trend of increasing childhood obesity, with 5% of the children being overweight. And this number, particularly in Asia, Southeast Asia, is concerning because it has doubled in the last 13 years. It was about 3.7% in 2007 and reaching 7.5% by 2020. So a doubling is very significant and is a sign of the diets which are actually available to the children, probably very highly processed, high in salt, sugar, and fat, and probably other things too. Eight countries in Oceania also showed an increase in childhood obesity. There's also a small rise in Southern Asia, but while it's lesser than the other regions, let's not forget that this actually goes together with a 30% rate in stunting and about a 15% rate in wasting. So clearly there is a double or a triple burden which, which is shaped up in Southern Asia. And again, an issue for all policymakers and all of us to address. We, we spoke about children, so let's now talk about women and mothers. Anemia is extremely common, particularly in Southern Asia. Every second woman is anemic, and no country is on course to reach the World Health Assembly target of a 50% reduction. And if you look at the figure on the right, you will see high bars all through, and almost probably the minimum figure here is about 10 to 12%. So no country has less than 10% of its women being anemic. So, and this, if you consider women as constituting at least 50% of the population or even more, then we are in very serious trouble. Even relatively richer countries who are listed in this figure also are struggling to reach the target. So again, a sign that the food, our food supply and our food production does not seem to focus enough on supplying micronutrients, because as all of you would know, anemia is caused by deficiency of iron in the diet. So the, uh, the failure even to supply uh, the simplest of micronutrients is a sign that our food systems need serious reform. The one couple of indicators where we have better news to convey is one is on exclusive breastfeeding of infants from zero to five months of age. This indicator has an encouraging trend 21 countries are above the target of achieving 50% or more uh, exclusive breastfeeding by 2025. Southern Asia and Oceania are definitely on track. So this is good news for Southern Asia, who have moved from 47% to 57 in about eight years. Whereas the other two regions, Southeastern Asia and Eastern Asia, need to increase the rate of progress. But nevertheless, this is one encouraging slide that we are happy to show all of you. The other encouraging indicator, although we wouldn't still call it um, anywhere close to a success story yet, 
is on low birth weight. Low birth weight is an indicator or a risk factor for neonatal mortality, stunting and illness. The World Health Assembly target is to achieve a 30% reduction by 2025. And let's remember that's only two years away. And the prevalence again here is highest in Southern Asia at about 26%. Most countries have made notable progress since 2000 with several reducing it by more than 10%. So let's just say again, to be more encouraging, we are on the right track here, but we could definitely accelerate our progress at this end. We then come to adult obesity. So we've spoken a lot so far about more on undernutrition, uh, about a lack of nutrients in the diet. So what happens if we go in the other direction, and especially if you have unhealthy food or much richer food than is actually required. And that becomes uh, overweight and obesity, and that's a risk factor for non-communicable diseases. And we clearly do, do know that many countries in Asia have high incidence of NCDs such as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiac troubles. Prevalence in the region of obesity is half the global average, which is sort of the good news, but nevertheless, it's rising. And the target of the World Health Assembly was not to have any increase or to have zero increase. And that is something, again, countries here are not meeting. Clearly, the countries in the Oceania region in the Pacific have high rates of adult obesity. And this is, again, a well-known problem, a lot of it linked to diets, which we will come to in a moment. So here comes now um, what, what is here we now start to look into what are the kind of things that we can do to ameliorate the situation. And the first thing that we would all probably say is to increase the availability and affordability of healthy diets. And the news on that front, again, is not great. Um, uh, this table on the slide has uh, very small numbers, but let me just focus on the five numbers on top. These are the numbers as the average cost of a healthy diet. First, the first box is for the Asia and Pacific region, followed by Eastern Asia, followed by Oceania, followed by Southeastern Asia, and then by Southern Asia. So across the region, the average cost of a healthy diet is almost $4 per person per day. And of course, it ranges slightly between the four sub-regions, but suffice to say, this is a very high cost. If you were to do a simple calculation um, and look at a family as consisting of four members, that would make $16 a day as the minimum cost of a healthy diet for all four members. For a month, it will be $480 or $500. And if you'd look at the average income across the region for most countries, let's leave out the richer ones or the developed economies here, you're actually looking at an income where the cost, the share of food is now approaching 50% or even higher. So this again makes it very difficult for families and households to ensure healthy diets for their children and for themselves, because then it doesn't leave room for other essential things such as housing, healthcare, and education. So overall, the fact again, coming back to what we were saying all along, that our food systems do not provide affordable healthy diets, and instead are forcing households to spend the major part of their income on feeding themselves is in itself an issue that we need to strongly address. That's where all the, uh, the issues related to policy, programming, and implementation on the field and comes into the picture. And here's where everyone has a role, whether it's the government or the private sector, or all of us who are working behind the scenes to look to provide the evidence on the kind of policies that are actually necessary. So or the, the, the high cost of a healthy diet actually has resulted in an overall increase of 78 million people in the region who cannot afford such a diet. And as you can see, it's a huge number. It's, 40, it's almost approaching 50% of the population in this region. So what can be done here? Given the setbacks over the last two years because of the pandemic and the decline uh, in this region in the fight against hunger, which, as we said, precedes the pandemic, these issues st started way before the pandemic actually took hold. We need to look at how we can reshape our food systems 
to make them efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, leaving no one behind, which we all know is the mantra of the SDGs. So the key steps here is to step up investment in agriculture, both public and private. And we need to keep our eyes on the smallholders and family farmers who make up more than 60 or 70% of the workforce in this region, particularly in the farm sector. Second is to fine tune and start implementing a food system transformation pathways, which were fostered through the process of the UN Food System Summit, as well as the Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2021. So we have those plans, we have analysis to back it up, and they are being and they are developed, being developed further as we speak, but this is the time to put those into action. Implementing the all important plan on global action plan on child wasting, which is a serious problem in this region as we have outlined. And again, all our agencies have collaborated to develop this global action plan. Yeah. Persisting with social protection programs, especially for women and children. And this was, uh, many of the countries had excellent experiences during the pandemic and these need to be persisted with. These, this is not an area for cost cutting, but in fact, an area for expansion. And finally, to repurpose agriculture policies to reduce the cost of healthy diets. Now, this comes with a caveat, and that is that when we try to reduce the cost of healthy diets and improve their affordability, there could be, there are trade-offs which need to be managed. And this particular figure, which we have taken from the global report on the state of food security and nutrition, you can look it up uh, later when you want to, because I know it's very small, but the point that's being made is it has to be a combination of measures. It needs to be about physical subsidies for consumers, for producers, as well as price incentives. But just one or two of them won't work because they will have negative effects either on the consumer or on the producer. So there are ways and means on which to achieve synergies between these measures to reduce the cost of healthy diets and improve their affordability. Finally, what are recommendations for repurposing these policies? Well, one is of course, as um, to repurpose them to ensure that farmers can actually specialize in the production of nutritious foods, to avoid trade-offs so that it may be which so it may be necessary to have physical subsidies for consumers. And where agriculture is the key to the economy, and let's remember in Asia, the agriculture sector, while economically not contributing lower and lower um, to the GDP of every country, it still has huge numbers of the population or majorities of the population still dependent. So increasing incomes in agriculture, farmers' incomes and job generation is very much what the government needs to be fo focusing on. And then, of course, international development finance will be needed for low and middle income countries, which uh, lower middle income countries, which FAO has been particularly been um, very vocal about in all the international fora. I now just br shift briefly to the special topic of this report. So every two years when we publish the flagship report, we have a special topic. In the past, we have focused on issues such as food safety, value chains, food loss and waste, uh, social protection, maternal diets, and child diets. And this time, it's urban food security and nutrition. And why are we doing that? Well, for I think the reason is very straightforward. Asia is urbanizing rapidly. Even as we speak, the population of the urban population of many countries is approaching 50% or probably has crossed that. And many other countries will be getting to that level by towards the end of the decade. So, when we actually get around to publishing our flagship reports, let's say around 2026, 2027, we'll actually be looking at the urban population making a huge contribution to the progress of the SDG indicators that we have talked about today. And therefore, we need to look at what are the constraints and challenges in urban environments? What are the cost-effective and scalable solutions adapted for city dwellers, especially for food security and nutrition? And what are the nutrition interventions that we need to scale up so that they also take, of double, take care of double duties, such as sanitation, healthcare, and education? And the key players we all know, it's local government, private sector, and schools. So in this report, um, where we would like to uh, hear first, I'd like to thank Decoda, which is represented by Sophie Goudet, who 
did the bulk of the work in providing us the analysis here. Uh, and what the report actually shows that cities across the region will need to accommodate a billion more people by 2050. They will have, this will have huge resource implications impacting the water, energy, and food systems. And while where urbanization has not occurred uniformly, the region is already home to 18 megacities. So cities which have a population of more than 10 million. And what the figure on the right actually will show you is that urbanization is rapidly rising. So if you were to actually plot this graph on a, you know, on a time scale, you would actually look at this as a rapidly rising curve. So this is clearly the next frontier in terms of um, ensuring uh, food security and nutrition for all going towards the SDGs. Now about 40% of this population in the urban regions lives in informal settlements or slums. And slums typically lack governance, planning and investment in infrastructure, and they lead to conditions which perpetuate poor food security and nutrition outcomes. And again, here on the figure you see, um, it's a selection of countries, it's not all the countries in the region, but you can actually see that most of them have a significant population living in informal settlements and in the slums. So tackling food insecurity and malnutrition here will actually be key to having better numbers in the reports that we will be publishing ahead. So this particular report on urban food security and nutrition covers the current trends in urban settings, for example, that of the growth of supermarkets, of online retail, which actually translates into easy availability of processed food and less availability of healthy food, the nutritional disadvantages and system determinants that are faced by the urban poor, so weaker food supply chains. We saw that happen in COVID because of the impact on transportation and of bringing food into the cities. There were definite uh, pressures on the, on the access of food for urban poor. Inferior wash, health, and education systems, individual factors and behavior. This volume will also give you a number of case studies, very interesting case studies, interventions, and analysis drawn from multiple cities and urban areas, which, which cover the nutrition status of mothers and children, the marketing intensity of unhealthy foods, the impacts of COVID-19, and the coping mechanisms ad adopted by local administration. Now, after I finish speaking, we will have a very interesting panel discussion where we will actually have three panelists who will share some of these experiences, and we hope that you will find very interesting for you to uh, also share with us and share with others. So what are the recommendations coming out of the urban part of this report? One is to expand outreach on based on evidence. So we need more data on urban poor. Second, to support an enabling environment, there's several measures that can be put in. So I don't need to go through all of them, but let's just say it's important to have initiatives on nutritious food, on having a better food environment, and initiatives such as urban farming and reduce food, reducing food loss and waste. Important to just to point out, urban agriculture is not just something which happens on rooftops of multi-storied buildings. It happens in gardens, it happens in the slums, it happens in many places. So here's a way to actually have local production and healthier food for all in the cities itself. Supporting SMEs, so supporting the local ecosystem of food vending, whether it's SMEs or street food vending and fresh markets to improve quality and food safety is another important aspect that actually bring, is brought out in this report. And lastly, just to one a final set of recommendations that the study makes is to protect the most vulnerable. And we've said that before, social protection programs are vital and social and behavioral change interventions, which will inform consumers of the healthy foods that they should eat and what is to be avoided, particularly in terms of processed food, foods which are, foods which are rich in salt, sugar, and fat, and policies which will promote those and also promote practices such as exclusive breastfeeding and infant nutrition, complementary feeding are all important uh, to, to follow up on. So, and, with, and then of course, imp all important item of wash infrastructure and services. So I hope you will find this uh, particular flagship report, which we'll soon put online, uh, interesting to read, 
to gather all the experiences that have been shared from all the urban areas, many urban areas in the Asia and the Pacific region, and also give everyone here food for thought on how we can uh, make healthy diets more affordable and accessible and reshape our food systems as part of the UNFSS process. So I thank you all for your attention and I thank everybody for being online and listening here today. So back to you, Alan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Dharmapuri, for sharing the main findings of uh, this really vitally important report this year. The gravity of it is, is clearly evident. Uh, this is a global story and in, indeed, the Associated Press has already filed a story uh, just a few moments ago. I see it's already in the Washington Post. So this will be, I'm sure, trending uh, now globally uh, in the coming hours. For you at, at home or in your offices uh, joining us today, if you wish to obtain a PDF copy of the report, uh, you may contact FAO by sending an email to my colleague, Ms. Liu. Uh, her contact details are currently there on the screen, and we'll share them with you a bit later on as well. Kindly note, uh, although the chat function has been disabled for the Zoom webinar, you can still join the discussion by inserting your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom, and our colleagues are monitoring that. Well, with that, let's now move on to our panel discussion that will deliberate on the theme of this year's SOFIA report, which is urban food security and nutrition, as uh, Sridhar was mentioning. And it's my pleasure to now introduce the moderator of this panel discussion, Mr. John Aliff, the Regional Director of the World Food Program at the Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. Mr. Aliff, over to you. I think you might be on mute. We're just trying to figure that out. Yes, I think we can hear you now. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Alan. Thank you to the regional representative of FAO. But thank you in particular to Mr. Damapuri for an outstanding presentation of the very sobering results of this year's SOFI report. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with you this morning uh, and to have the opportunity to moderate a discussion with prominent figures and experts who I'm sure will not only inspire you, but also motivate you to bring change and to drive progress in your respective countries. I know, having heard the presentation, that as we meet here today, many of you may feel frustrated or disheartened because we've been, we've had a setback, let's admit it, in the past few years, a reversal of the progress that we'd seen in food security and nutrition in the region, an erosion in many senses of our hard earned development gains. Over 1 billion people in the region experiencing moderate or severe food insecurity is really a chilling number. In a way, we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, the structural barriers to better food insecurity, or to better food security and nutrition, have been known for decades and they've been well studied. And governments have been working steadily to address them. Stark inequalities, healthy diets being out of reach for a staggering 1.9 billion people, is some insufficient coverage of social protection programs, particularly for those working in the informal sectors, low levels of education and their correlation with high rates of malnutrition. And what the SOFI report shows us clearly is that in spite of many efforts, progress made in removing these barriers has been too modest. The report shows us that in the past few years, when multiple shocks hit food systems, households and individuals, they didn't fare as well as we would have hoped or expected. There was much less resilience in the system than we had led ourselves to believe. And the report shows, as has been highlighted, that the problem was not just rural, it was acutely urban and that our investments in urban food security have been deficient. But my intention today is not to depress the audience, in fact, far from it. Um, my intention is to point out and to bring in our panelists to prove that there is much to inspire us. There is much to be proud of and optimistic about. Looking across our region, there are many visionary governments with the right policies, making the right investments investments which are creating that long-term resilience and bringing marked progress in reducing hunger and malnutrition. 
And there are many visionary individuals who through their success are inspiring us and shining a light on the innovative solutions which can shape our tomorrow. It's my immense pleasure this morning to introduce you to three such individuals, people who are leading lights in their countries, but also have insights, programs which can enrich our understanding and practical examples of how we can get this right. Examples of how we can bring sustainable change. So this morning, I have the great honor to introduce Dr. Azucena Dayang Hirang, Assistant Secretary of the Department of Health of the Philippines and Executive Director of the National Nutrition Council. Dr. Azucena is the lead on the Philippines multi-sectoral action plan for nutrition, but also she is the country's focal point for the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and is a member of the Executive Committee of the Global Sun Movement representing Asia. Likewise, I have the honor to introduce Dr. H. Moldoko, Chief of Staff in the Executive Office of the President of the Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Moldoko is advisor to the President on food security, one of the key priorities for the country, and also one of the top policy priorities of the President. And I have the honor to introduce Brigadier General Mohammed Zabaidur Rahman, Chief Medical Officer of Dhaka North City Corporation, Bangladesh. Brigadier General Rahman has an inspiring vision for creating safe, sustainable and resilient food systems in urban areas. And he has helped highlight how critical it is to work with street food vendors in the city, promoting better food and promoting better food safety. If I may first turn to you, Dr. Muldoko. The pandemic and some subsequent high price crises, the five Fs, they're having a major impact, but we know that we were seeing regression even before the pandemic hit. What do you see, Dr. Moldoko, as the principal reasons for the lack of progress in food security and nutrition since 2015? Thank you, John, as a moderator and all speakers. I'm very sorry I have to speak in Indonesia because my English is very good, you know. So don't worry, I have a, a, the very best in, interpreter. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I have to talk to in Indonesian language. Yes, as what your about your question, beberapa indikator ketahanan pangan dan nutrisi global menunjukkan stagnasi dalam beberapa tahun terakhir. Bahkan beberapa negara saat ini mengalami situasi yang lebih buruk. Krisis yang terjadi karena konflik dan perlambatan ekonomi global akibat dampak dari COVID-19 secara signifikan menyebabkan kondisi stagnasi. Selain krisis, Maksud saya, selain krisis global, terdapat beberapa faktor lain yang juga menyebabkan stagnasi dari ketahanan pangan dan nutrisi, yaitu perubahan iklim, kurang investasi di sektor pembangunan pertanian dan pedesaan, persoalan kemiskinan struktural yang utamanya terkait dengan akses terhadap pangan dan bergisi, pangan yang bergisi, Berikutnya, pada masa pandemi, pemerintah Indonesia bukan hanya berhasil mengantarkan masyarakat keluar dari badai pandemi dengan kondisi makroekonomi yang stabil, namun Indonesia juga berhasil menjaga ketahanan pangan bagi 275 juta penduduknya. Sektor pertanian merupakan sektor yang paling resilient, bahkan mencatatkan pertumbuhan di masa pandemi. Sektor pertanian yang tumbuh positif di tahun 2020, 2021, dan 2022. Produk domestik bruto atau PDB pertanian pada kuartal keempat 2020 telah tumbuh sebesar 2,59 persen secara year on year. 2,28 persen di tahun 2021, 1,65 persen pada kuartal ketiga 2022 dan berkontribusi 12,91 persen terhadap PDB. Pemerintah juga berhasil meningkatkan ekspor hasil pertanian sebesar 10,52 persen dari 
4,24 miliar US dollar di tahun 2021 menjadi 4,69 miliar di tahun 2022. Capaian ini berkat pemerintah memberikan berbagai macam subsidi sektor pertanian berupa subsidi pupuk, alat alat pertanian, sarana pertanian, dan pemberian bibit serta kredit usaha ringan terhadap para petani. Itu kira-kira kenapa kita memiliki hmm, apa itu apa ketahanan cukup baik dalam menghadapi situasi yang krisis ini. Thank you so much, Dr. Motoko. Interesting to hear how um, Indonesia was so successful in keeping its agricultural sector vibrant uh, during the crisis, providing subsidies, um, fertilizer and seeds to the extent that you managed to increase exports and um, as in, in addition to sustaining the food supplies for such a staggering number of people, 275 million. Um, may I ask you, there have been some successful initiatives um, to mitigate hunger and poverty in urban areas, and some of these are quoted in, in our SOFI report. Um, could you tell us about one or more of the initiatives that have been taken in Indonesia in this regard? Ya, yeah. uh, ketahanan pangan Indonesia menguat pada tahun 2022 setelah sempat melemah sepanjang dua tahun awal pandemi. Menurut, menurut Global Food Security Index, indeks ketahanan pangan Indonesia pada 2022 berada di level 60,2 lebih tinggi dibandingkan pada periode 20-2021. Global Food Security Index menilai harga pangan di Indonesia cukup terjangkau dibandingkan dengan negara-negara lain. Terlihat dari skor affordability Indonesia yang mencapai 81,4 persen, cukup jauh di atas rata-rata Asia Pasifik yang skornya 73,4 persen. Memang ketahanan pangan Indonesia masih lebih rendah 2 poin dari rata-rata global. Untuk mendorong hal itu, pemerintah memberikan akses kemudahan dan pemberdayaan bagi petani seperti yang saya sebutkan sebelumnya. Indonesia juga memiliki kebijakan akses tanah bagi para petani dengan konsep reforma agraria yang sudah mencapai 9 juta hektar terdiri dari redistribusi lahan dan legalisasi aset tanah bagi para petani. Regenerasi petani pun sudah kami siapkan dengan program petani milenial yang jumlahnya saat ini mencapai 222 ribu orang. Berikutnya, pengembangan pangan alternatif seperti sorghum yang sesuai dengan kondisi lahan dan cuaca di Indonesia. Pada tahun 2022, pemerintah mengembangkan lahan sorghum seluas 4.600 hektar dengan total produksi 52.500 ton dan diharapkan menjadi 150.000 hektar pada tahun berikutnya dan pada akhirnya tahun 2024 akan mencapai Uh, kurang lebih 200.000 hektar untuk capaian 200, uh, 2024. Terkait perubahan iklim, pemerintah memiliki program aksi adaptasi untuk mengantisipasi dampak-dampak dampak tersebut, termasuk penggunaan varietas tanaman yang tahan kekeringan dan bantuan benih bagi yang kena pusu. Selanjutnya, menjaga ketersediaan pengairan dengan membangun bendungan. Selama Presiden Joko Widodo, bendungan telah banyak sekali dibangun dan menormalisasi saluran penampungan air atau embung-embung. Mengedepankan puri daya pangan sesuai dengan paritas lokal, kami juga sudah memiliki peta kerawanan pangan dan gizi dengan sistem peringatan dini, sehingga penanganan bisa tepat sasaran. Ini untuk mengantisipasi dampak perubahan iklim terhadap pertanian. Demikian. Thank you Dr. Moldoko. So um, it seems that agrarian reforms, investments in farmers and measures to reduce the impact of climate change were among the measures which drove um, better availability of food in Indonesia. 
um, coupled with an early warning system to allow the government to intervene where required when uh, climate factors were, were coming into play. Um, thank you for sharing that, those examples with us. Um, if I may turn now to you, Dr. Azucena, um, uh, and let me focus the discussion now a bit more on nutrition, if I may. Uh, one of the reasons there's been insufficient progress on nutrition in the region is that tackling malnutrition has been seen too much and perhaps for far too long as a health intervention to be dealt with exclusively by health services. I know, Dr. Azucena, that you've been instrumental in introducing a multi-sectoral approach to tackling malnutrition in the Philippines. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you've achieved that and what lessons you would share from the Philippines with other countries? Hey, um, thank you. Thank you very much, John, and uh, pleasant morning and afternoon to all. Actually, um, here in the Philippines, as a scaling up nutrition uh, focal point or coordinator, and at the same time, the executive director of the National Nutrition Council, uh, Philippines, uh, starting off with my organization, the National Nutrition Council, as the country's sun coordinator, our main objective really is to promote nutrition and healthy diets. Uh, through a multi-sectoral and intersectoral approach. Now, this is uh, our main goal uh, for uh, really pushing nutrition programs from the national down to the sub-national as well as the local government units here in the Philippines. Actually, um, to, to add further, uh, the, the sun, the scaling up nutrition here in the Philippines, actually we are the 61st country to join the sun movement. And uh, our main goal for joining the movement is to further improve our existing multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral strategies to achieve our goals for nutrition, such as the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition and the Sustainable Development Goals being achieved by 2028 and 2030. Now, John, as a country coordinator of the NNC or the National Nutrition Council, my agency actually brings people together through the multi-stakeholder platform to work together across sectors using a unique approach that works for our country, the Philippines. Now, right now, the Philippines has already formed actually four networks who are now partners for nutrition. And these are the a, B, C, D, and soon we will be organizing the Y. So the A stands for the academe, the business, the civil society alliance, and the D for the development partners of the UN networks. And soon to be organized is the Y, what where we call the youth network. So um, the Sun Academic Network focuses their initiatives to capacitate nutrition workers along policy and program formulation, as well as nutrition promotion. And uh, the Sun Business Network is composed of members of the food and non-food big companies in the Philippines, as well as micro, small, and medium enterprises, while making it inclusive for all our private sector partners. Now, their initiatives include food fortification, food development, production and marketing of healthy diets, corporate social responsibility, research on food and nutrition and financial assistance to government and among others. Now, the Sun Civil Society Alliance and the most mature network here convened by the World Vision Development Foundation plays actually multiple roles in our fight against malnutrition. And their initiatives include nutrition advocacy and promotion, policy development, and localization of policies, capacity building, and strengthening links between networks and the government. Now, and the last is the, the fourth is the Sun Development Partners Network, which is composed of the United Nations organizations of the donors, which focus on providing technical and financial assistance for nutrition and as well as nutrition related projects in the Philippines. Actually, UNICEF has always been providing technical and financial assistance to the Philippines since the early 1990s under their country program for children. On the other hand, FAO and the World Food Program have also provided technical assistance to NSC along food security projects. So that would be all for now, John. Back to you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Azazena. First of all, I think um, your, your vision for a National Nutrition Council, which sits at high level above ministries and coordinates across those ministries and across the various actors is an excellent one. Uh, it's not peculiar to the Philippines, but it has worked particularly well in the Philippines and I'm sure will inspire others to think through how that mechanism could bring more multisectoral approaches. Um, secondly, I really uh, laud you for the ABCD why um, and just underline how critical it is to bring together academia, business networks, civil society, development networks, and very importantly, youth, increasingly important for our region. And so again, something really to look to the Philippines for and to be inspired by. And thank you so much for sharing that, that vision with us. We'll come back to you um, later in the proceedings. Um, I'd like to turn now to you, Brigadier General Rahman, um, and I'd like to bring us to this critical theme of urban contexts and how they require different approaches. Um, the SOFI report shows us clearly that unsafe food is a major threat to adequate nutrition in urban areas. Could you tell us more, Brigadier General, how you have approached this problem in Dakar North, and in particular, how your work with street food vendors is bringing change, such positive change? Thank you very much. Uh, there is, uh, you know, in uh, uh, our country, there is uh, food security, food safety. This is uh, for the developing countries. This ensured very efficiently, uh, undoubtedly. But, uh, you know, for Bangladesh, that is in our perspective, we are having some uh, sort of unique problems, you know, there is uh, in our country, there is in Dhaka city, there is a total population is, there is uh, more than 20 million, 20 million people residing in Dhaka city. And in Dhaka North city, it is population is 12 million. So is a huge number of people population residing and, you know, uh, there is for in each square kilometer of Dhaka city, uh, more than 49,000 people are residing in each square kilometer. So, and uh, this is a big problem that is uh, highly crowded. Uh, and another thing that is the almost uh, about 30% of the people, they reside in the slums. And in, you know, in our Dhaka, North city, we are having uh, about 500 slums. And many people are residing in these slum areas. Many are the floating people. They're staying in uh, railway stations, in the platform, in the bus terminals, on in the launch terminal. terminal. There they are uh, staying. So this is a big challenge for uh, ensuring the food uh, supply chain, food safety, and uh, nutrition for this uh, population. At the same time, there is, uh, you know, urban uh, uh, food that is, uh, we are having many food, street food vendors, and many people are having their food from these street food vendors. But uh, main challenge is there is the proper sanitation and hygienic measures are not taken and uh, the people are also not aware of that is uh, how to uh, maintain the uh, uh, hygiene of the food. So uh, our prime responsibility is to train them. That is how to uh, uh, make the food healthy, how to uh, serve it healthy way. And uh, another problem we are having that is food adulteration, you know, there is, uh, this is also checked by our legislation. Sometimes we conduct uh, some of the mobile courts for these street food vendors, for the uh, hotels and restaurants. There is those who are, whether the, uh, they are uh, providing the food which is safe for human consumption or not, and these are healthy or not, these are uh, checked. At the same time, as we are, uh, uh, another problem we are having for providing the fresh 
uh, food supply to the people. That is the uh, farmers there or the produce growers what they are producing. That is the vegetables or meat or uh, uh, meat or fish. That is our poultry. They are not getting the actual price because the uh, what they are getting. Maybe the consumers in this city, they are purchasing it in much higher price, maybe double or at times in uh, triple price. They have to pay for getting those fresh vegetables or the fish or meat. For that, uh, we are having some initiative for farmer's market. And uh, this farmer's market, there is uh, directly the growers can market those yeah, they are uh, producers in this market and the consumers can buy buy directly from the growers. So uh, uh, very fresh food and uh, in a very cheaper rate they are getting. This is uh, 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 popular in amongst the people, but the thing is uh, um, this, uh, uh, not in all the areas we could yet implement, but we are uh, trying to implement in uh, all the areas of Dhaka city. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, at present, we are affected by three Cs, that is climate, COVID, and conflict. And uh, after COVID, we are having, uh, we had to suffer a lot the, uh, for the dengue situation in our Dhaka city. And uh, so we had to, uh, combat the health issues also at the same time we have to combat and um, for the uh, providing the nutrition for the people we are having uh, some of the maternity centers where we can provide the uh, nutritional support and nutritional advice and counseling and also education for the mothers and the adolescent girls or boys uh, we are providing that at the same time government is also uh, providing some sort of subsidy in the agriculture sector so that uh, the farmers uh, will get benefited and the consumers can also get um, in the um, uh, right price or cheaper uh, lower price they can get it and uh, uh, we are having some programs uh, of um, uh, food fortification we are having and uh, uh, some of the food are fortified and you know there is uh, we have added iodine in our salt marketing so uh, the problem of goiter or the iodine deficiency is uh, eliminated from the country so by this uh, only by addition this iodine in the food uh, in the uh, salt and by that uh, we are trying to uh, uh, provide the safe food for our citizens and what our that is Dhaka food agenda we are having uh, Dhaka food agenda 2041 we are heading towards a uh, goal for that goal for a healthy resilient and urban food system we are um, heading towards that that is you know every day we are in different areas we are uh, going to the uh, uh, sellers, that is for the fish traders, meat traders, for the um, uh, uh, live bird market, uh, that is poultry traders and other vegetable traders. We are teaching them how to, educating them, how they will be ensuring the uh, uh, safe food, how they can uh, minimize the uh, wastage of the, uh, their products or the food. You know, in our country, there is due to transportation and marketing, uh, almost uh, 25 to 30 percent of the vegetables or fruits which are produced, these are wasted. So, um, if this wastage could be prevented, then uh, this 30 percent value could be added, and the price would be much lesser. And this could definitely keep a good role in elimination of hunger and poverty and also nutrition for those uh, uh, terminally poor people. So uh, this way we are working and I hope there is uh, by the educating the people, by uh, uh, training 
and by the, you know, the other campaigns and slogans, we can uh, uh, ensure the safe food for the city dwellers. And in this, this uh, regards, we are working for a quite uh, long period and we, are, uh, we, can, we could achieve definitely certain um, uh, targets we could achieve and we are heading towards Dhaka uh, safe food for the Dhaka people by 2041. Thank you. Thank you, Brigadier General. Thank you for sharing with us the array of measures you're taking uh, and the government of Bangladesh is taking to assure resilient um, food systems. Um, thank you for talking about uh, urban uh, informal settlements, which are critical and pointing out that food is uh, cooked less often in those settlements, more often sourced from vendors, small scale vendors. And thank you for yeah. telling us some of the things that you're leading and spearheading in working with local vendors to ensure food safety. Um, thank you for also mentioning the how critical it is to get um, rural to urban supply chains working properly and that um, we need to work at both ends of that chain, the demand side, but also at the supply side, reducing food waste and food losses uh, post-harvest, but also uh, looking at the transport from urban to uh, rural, uh, from rural rather to urban areas and the price incentives that may be needed for smallholder farmers. Excellent, thank you, that was so rich. Um, I'm gonna turn Thanks. now back to Dr. Moldoko, if I may, and I want to steer us a little bit towards a critical factor, which is financing of, um, of these initiatives, financing of food security and nutrition initiatives. Um, Dr. Moldoko, governments have clearly done the heavy, lift, heavy lifting in financing nutrition, often matching development partner resources through co-investment and co-financing. Um, how is Indonesia investing in nutrition and food security and what message would you have mm -hmm. for our audience of partners who may be listening in today? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, di tahun 2018, 30,8 persen balita di Indonesia mengalami stunting dan 10,2 persen mengalami malnutrisi. Untuk mengatasi persoalan tersebut, perbaikan terhadap status nutrisi menjadi salah satu prioritas pemerintah. Di tahun 2024, pemerintah menargetkan angka stunting turun menjadi 14 persen, dan angka malnutrisi turun menjadi 7 persen. Dalam hal ini, pemerintah telah menyusun strategi nasional percepatan penurunan stunting, yang mana menekankan pemerintah pusat dan daerah bersama-sama untuk berkoordinasi dan melakukan intervensi sensitif dan spesifik untuk menurunkan angka prevalensi stunting tersebut. Beberapa perkembangan baik telah terlihat. Berdasarkan survei status nutrisi pada tahun 2022, angka prevalensi stunting di Indonesia menurun dari 30,8 persen menjadi 24,4 persen di tahun 2022. Selain itu, pemerintah juga mengupayakan penghapusan kemiskinan ekstrim di tahun 2024. Program perlindungan dan jaminan sosial pengadaan infrastruktur sanitasi, intervensi nutrisi, dan beberapa program lainnya ditargetkan dan diprioritaskan untuk menyasar rumah tangga miskin ekstrim dan termasuk juga domisilinya. domisilinya. Pemerintah juga telah membangun data yang komprehensif di tingkat individu rumah tangga untuk memastikan bahwa seluruh intervensi atau program yang diberikan dapat ditargetkan secara tepat meminimalisir terjadinya inclusion dan exclusion errors. Pesan kepada donor, sebagai upaya untuk menjaga ketahanan pangan dan nutrisi global, kita perlu melakukan kolaborasi antar pemangku kepentingan, menyatukan kekuatan tidak hanya di dalam negeri, tetapi juga secara global, sehingga sesuai dengan semangat 
SVJS tidak ada seorang pun yang tertinggal dengan cepatnya perubahan dunia ini. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Doctor, and I um, appreciate it in particular your um, sharing with us the vision for reducing extreme poverty in Indonesia. Uh, the fact that stunting plays, reducing stunting plays such a big and important role in that, and for mentioning your national strategy, uh, which involves not only central government, but also engages very strongly the regional governments as well. Um, I appreciate also your reference to, to the importance of data um, to, to drive um, both better policy, but also in particular targeting and how our efficiency gains, which can be um, which can be reaped through better targeting, are so important to these programs. Um, so my thanks to you. Um, staying on this subject of, of financing and the challenges of, of, of getting enough funding and financing for nutrition and food security, um, in particular nutrition, um, governments across the region struggle to give sufficient prominence to nutrition in national budgeting processes, not because there's a lack of will, but quite simply because they are inundated with so many le legitimate priorities. And at the same time, the dilemma is governments understand more than at any time in the past, the implications of not investing sufficiently in nutrition. They understand that chronically malnourished children live less healthy lives, stay less time in formal education, grow up to be less productive, Governments understand the linkages between stunting in particular and a country's future uh, GDP. There is no simple answer to this very real dilemma that governments face. Um, but Dr. Azuzena, I know you've been a strong advocate for putting nutrition in particular at the center. And I wanted to ask you, Dr. Azuzena, how you've gone about raising the prominence of nutrition in the Philippines raising awareness, raising the debate, bringing the debate to decision makers, and particularly at the time of budget cycle, in, in the right moments in the budget cycles and during budgeting processes. So over to you, Dr. Azucena, if I may pass you the floor. All right, um, thank you very much, John, for that question. Actually, um, there are lots of challenges here in the Philippines as regards to really putting investments on nutrition. Uh, year by year, um, the National Nutrition Council, my agency, has always been at the forefront in advocating for increased investment, especially among our local government units or the sub-national level. Now, because we, we see and we realize that the local government units are really the ones who are tasked to really uh, ensure that nutrition program will be at the core of their development program uh, per uh, local government units. Now, advocating uh, day by day, whenever I have talks, especially when I am invited to uh, be a keynote speaker in all fora here in the Philippines, be at the national level down to the local government units, I see it as an opportunity to advocate the local chief executives that indeed good nutrition is good governance. Now, year by year, um, there are lots of increasing investments, especially in local government units. Now, because of our campaign of increasing investments, we have um, conducted to um, all our local government units. We have 81 provinces all over the Philippines. And we started the initiative of providing them with technical assistance, especially on the conduct of um, local nutrition action planning workshop. And because we see this as a very important, as a basic requirement that without a plan, a local nutrition action plan, you cannot just uh, provide yearly or annual budgets for a nutrition program in every local government units. That's one. And second, here at the national level, we really see the need to promote and to advocate to our local legislators, so our, I mean, our national legislators. And we see some uh, progress as far as advocating to congressmen and to lawmakers and senators here in the Philippines. And in fact, 
We have lots of pending bills at the Congress, and we know for a fact that it is our job, my job, to really push for lawmakers that indeed nutrition is very important, so that not so that uh, the the nutritional situation of the of the country will be um, will be solved, especially so that during the advent of you know um, COVID nineteen pandemic, as well as today, we are in, experiencing uh, inflation, hiring inflation rate, high, high rising inflation rate, I mean, so there are less or more and more people who can afford to buy uh, nutritious diets, more so with, you know, here at the urban setting, uh, lack of uh, supply of nutritious food coming from the rural areas. And so second is, uh, the third one is really to, uh, also assess why local government units, all local government units have not been able to steadily increase their investments on nutrition. So yesterday I, I have been in uh, one of the, of the year end evaluation with the UNICEF Philippines and uh, I, I closed the program. I, in my closing statement, I said that all we have to do right now are three points. One is assess the local government units, their capacities, their capacities, institutional capacities, teaching the local local level uh, nutrition workers, the planners themselves, that indeed nutrition is very important. So in, invest more investments on nutrition, more money for nutrition and more nutrition for the money. And then second is we must also involve the youth. The youth uh, are very particularly because we have rising adolescent pregnant pregnancy. So pregnancy among our adolescent girls. So uh, we must always involve the youth, not just in you know sports, but also in nutrition. They themselves must realize that nutritious diets are very important for them and for the, the, them to take on the responsibility of being adults in the near future. And third is, we must never be working anymore in silos, no? So uh, we must take a concerted effort, commitment. All of us should have commitment. And then um, all the sectors involved, multi-stakeholders, everybody was love and care for nutrition. We must work hand in hand with government. And together we shall be, you know, we, we, we will be reaching our targets, including uh, nutrition at all points. Back to you, John. Thank you so much, Dr. Zosena. And I really, again, appreciate uh, you sharing with us uh, the power, I think, of, um, of having this multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, you mentioned lawmakers, congressmen, senators, but also taking that all the way down to the local government units at the most decentralized level of government. Um, and as you said, uh, involving youth being so critical. Um, I appreciate also your notion that uh, the budgeting um, can't be done on a, on a short-term basis. We need a longer-term vision in the form of um, nutrition action plans, which go multiple year, uh, and we need to think beyond government budgeting cycles and, and look, look long-term as we consider our national investments into nutrition. Um, thank you, Dr. Azazina. Uh, we're a little bit short of time, um, but I would uh, like to um, ask my last question to Brigadier General Rachman. Um, and it's on the subject of coordination. It's another strong challenge. If we don't have enough money, uh, the benefits of being coordinated suddenly become amplified. They're amplified anyway. But getting those synergies um, between the actions in nutrition of different actors um, is always a challenge, but can bring, bring immense um, benefits. Um, Brigadier uh, General Rahman, how do you, as Chief Medical Officer in Dhaka North, how do you go about coordinating government, bilateral and NGO programs, ensuring this complementarity, avoiding overlap, and making sure that each investment is giving us the best return? Yeah. Thank you, because uh, you know, for any sort of sustainable development or anything uh, to be successful for a quite long period, we need to be uh, have the concerted effort and the coordination 
amongst the, all the stakeholders. That's why what we do, that is we uh, conduct a uh, regular meeting with the concerned ministry, that is Ministry of Food, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Livestock, and uh, the Ministry of Local Government, uh, and Ministry of Health. There is all these are the stakeholder ministries. So we do coordinate with these ministries. Uh, and uh, actually, any type of meeting we are conducting, uh, always or any sort of training program we do conduct for the uh, vendors or for the uh, uh, food sellers or the restaurant owners training program. In that uh, case, always there is a representative from the Ministry of uh, uh, Livestock, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of uh, uh, Food, and uh, uh, our uh, development partners like uh, UNICEF, FAO, always they are working with us in these regards regarding food and nutrition. Moreover, the um, all the N NGOs, you know, many of the NGOs they are working in Dhaka City and in Bangladesh. You know, many of the NGOs are working and there most of the ngos they are working in uh, uh, nutrition sector they are working in the health sector and uh, you know, for the maternal and child health matters they are working so and uh, you know in our all the health outlets we are having the nutrition counselors we are uh, having some sort of uh, nutritional package program so we do provide the nutrition uh, uh, nutri uh, uh, food support to the terminally poor people uh, uh, for the uh, weekly basis, for monthly basis, we do provide them uh, uh, some type of food like egg, then uh, milk, for uh, then some cereals so that they get the proper nutrition. And you know, uh, there is, we are having the some, uh, um, there is, Severely malnourished children, they are assessed. The moderately malnourished children, they are assessed, and they are uh, they are treated in close supervision so that they can uh, these uh, children can uh, recover from this malnutrition. So by that we could uh, get a very good success in this regards. And uh, uh, now actually we are trying to improve the uh, our market condition, that is uh, food sellers, uh, hygiene and sanitation and uh, food safety. We are trying to ensure for that we are having the food safety authority. This is a government organization. They are always working with uh, collaboration with the city corporation and the FAO, they are working. And we are having the BSTI, that is uh, Bangladesh Standard Testing uh, Institute. There is they are uh, uh, searching for the food adulteration or anything which is uh, detrimental to the health of the people. They are searching, they are finding, and they are uh, taking the legislative measures. And our city corporation also, we are uh, implementing the uh, law and uh, sometimes we are filing cases or we are uh, imposing fine to the people, those who are not maintaining the standard by that. Uh, with the collaboration of the Food Safety Authority, uh, FAO, other NGOs, our local government ministry, and the Ministry of Health, Agriculture, Fisheries, and other livestock, all the ministries are working together. And that's uh, the way we are proceeding, heading uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we've heard today about um, the how critical that central level coordination is, but what you've helped us to understand, Brigadier General, is the is how critical, even more so perhaps, is the coordination which happens at the grassroots level, at the implementation level, and how steering all actors around a common goal there um, can be so very powerful. Um, time is unfortunately out. Um, I would like to very sincerely thank our amazing panelists for giving us those uh, that inspiration, their insights, sharing their experience, and giving us some very practical and real examples of how we can do better 
uh, coming out of this uh, challenging SOFI report and the, um, the rather sobering results that it gives us. Uh, it shows us that there is a forward direction and some examples to be um, to aspire to. Um, our panelists have high highlighted some of the critical factors in any approach in tackling food insecurity and malnutrition and factors which will give us a better chance of success. Factors such as uh, looking beyond the health sector when we deal with malnutrition and treating malnutrition as a multi-sectoral challenge, um, such as um, uh, the, 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 the realization that these standalone interventions in single sectors or looking just at one end of our food system, either supply or demand end, will not work effectively. And that a blend of measures uh, is needed, which are carefully calibrated, coordinated, and balanced. Um, ensuring collectively that as many government investments as possible contribute to better food security and nutrition outcomes. We need to look across agricultural, social, social welfare, education, and health. Um, the need to ensure stronger linkages between, between agriculture and nutrition, making smallholder farmers part of the solution in both rural and urban areas, looking at urban agriculture. Um, the need to look across the whole food system if we're going to tackle this challenge, particularly of urban food insecurity. And recognizing overall that urban areas where a growing pop proportion of the regions malnourished reside require a different approach and, as that, and that as part of that approach, food safety is such a critical component. Finally, then the importance of advocacy to all stakeholders um, and the engagement of all stakeholders from the, the lawmakers down to the grassroots and particularly involving the youth. As I said at the outset, there are grounds to be optimistic, a reason to be inspired, but we do need, uh, quoting uh, an earlier speaker, we do need urgent systemic and multi-sectoral action. This is what the regional representative of FAO urged at the beginning, and it's absolutely right. I would argue though, that there's no better time for us to get this right than now, when countries across the region are reeling with the impact of an economic and food security crisis, which is intensifying daily. And so I urge you, let's go back to our respective jobs in countries across the region, and let's use the roles that we play to deliver better solutions for those who need us most. Let's go back with renewed energy and resolve to deliver better food security and nutrition, especially for the 1 billion people in our region today who have the potential to contribute so much more to the development of their countries and communities, but are being held back by abject hunger and malnutrition. Thank you so much for listening today. And with those final words, allow me to hand back to our, to our MC. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aliff uh, and all the panelists for sharing your interesting insights on the importance of placing food and nutrition at the heart of the development agenda. And as we've been discussing, that's exactly where it needs to be. Well, we have received, we still have some time remaining uh, and I'll open the floor now for questions that we've already received uh, from some of our viewers who are joining us live on Zoom and on YouTube. And indeed, we've actually received quite a few. So what the team here has done is we've tried to consolidate these into three or four questions. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to bring it back to each of the uh, four agencies that have contributed to this report. Uh, so I'd like to go to WFP first. Um, and so the colleague who can answer this, we'd ask you to raise your hand so that we can identify you, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we'll, um, we'll spotlight you. So the question is, if you could comment on uh, how the food and feed shortages due to the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, affected the Asia Pacific region. We know we don't have the, the data yet, as has already been explained by Sridhar, but but we do know that there's been an impact. So if a colleague from WFP would like to, to uh, take that question, my colleagues are looking for the hands now. Just bear with us a minute. I can take that, Alan, if... Sure, you... go ahead, please, please. Yeah, let me begin, and if any other WFP colleague wants to come in, that would be also fine. Um, it's an excellent question. And I just wanted to point out, first of all, that it's not just the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which has driven up prices. Um, what obviously we faced is um, rising prices before the conflict. 
uh, rising prices on account of the trillions of dollars of stimulus that were pumped into global economies. Uh, so I wanted to make that that point up front. The Russian Ukraine crisis has, has exacerbated significantly and disrupted food uh, supply chains and fertilizer supply chains. Uh, but it wasn't the only driver here. Uh, we were facing problems before the war came along. Um, I think as we've surveyed um, uh, household food security across the region, uh, we've seen um, uh, that more and more the poor are being priced out of the market. And that's our biggest concern. I think the FAO representative, regional representative spoke about this at the beginning. But our, our um, obviously playing out in different ways in different countries, but more and more poor being priced out of the market is is a fundamental concern. Um, and we're not over that yet. Um, what we fear at WFP um, is that um, people's coping mechanisms, and we've seen it, are eroded. Um, they're eroded in ways we've not seen for, for decades here. Uh, coping is at an all time low. And it's particularly low in countries where you've got this combination of factors, climate change impacts, uh, the high prices, uh, the impacts of coming out of COVID. Um, and so we have a number of countries on our watch list, and we know governments do as well. Um, I think um, what we look to FAO for is a sense of, um, of, of what's coming next. Uh, we know that fertilizer availability and prices have been an impediment to some of the harvests, which we'll see in 2023. And so we fear that through those lower uh, through lower production, uh, the problem I've described will only be exacerbated. And so we are bracing ourselves for a 2023, which uh, which could be uh, without wishing to strike a tone of doom and gloom, uh, 2023, which could potentially be worse. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to direct the next question. Uh, again, these are consolidated from our viewers uh, to UNICEF. Um, and it's regarding uh, overweight in children. So what strategies are being put in place in this region? that you're aware of to tackle the issues of child uh, overweight? Uh, if somebody from UNICEF could raise a hand. Um, yes, hello, this is uh, Roland Kupka from uh, UNICEF. No, this is an excellent question. Um, to me, the overriding principle here is that we have to make it easier to eat well. Um, and what uh, therefore many uh, partners are doing in support of government actions is to uh, specifically improve so-called food environments. That is to help um, populations uh, to make the right choices uh, with regard to healthy eating, to make it easier to make the right choices, uh, to work on the um, availability of healthy foods, the affordability of healthy foods, but also the desirability of healthy foods. And to do so, uh, what we're specifically working on and supporting our government partners on is to put in place the right policies. Um, and those policies include, for instance, restrictions on the uh, marketing of unhealthy foods to children uh, to have uh, uh, adequate nutrition labeling in place, but also work on the financial aspects of things. And for instance, to decrease the that desirability of unhealthy foods by specifically taxing them as uh, in the case of uh, sugar sweetened beverages. So there really a range of tools now that we have available and we're very um, you know, interested in uh, driving those forward in the region. Okay, thank you very much uh, indeed for that. Uh, yeah, sugary products, uh, they're, they're hard to avoid, aren't they, these days, and have been for some time. Okay, the next question, uh, again, consolidated for FAO, so I guess Sridhar in this room. Um, as, as we've all reported in, 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 in the SOFI, uh, cities are growing uh, and continuing to grow, and lower-income people are mar migrating to, to these urban areas. Uh, how can they access uh, some of this urban uh, agriculture for them to get a, a better diet. Uh, Sridhar, can you take that? Thank you, Alan. So I'll be brief on it. I think we heard a good example today from Brigadier General uh, Rehman in Dhaka on how they are actually going about it, uh, how um, the Dhaka North City Corporation has focused on some of the slum areas and with assistance from agencies such as FAO, as well as with a number of other international NGOs, they're actually providing 
the tools and materials which are required to turn some of these spaces in, in near around the slums, which otherwise would have been wasteland, into growing areas for vegetables. So those are the, that is one way of doing it. And here's where it's very important that the policymaker or, in fact, the civic authority, which Brigadier General re represents, they actually play a part because they are the ones who provide the enabling environment for such things to happen, and particularly for low-income groups who otherwise would not have had access. So that's uh, at the ground level that I can give you one example that we heard. This, the, at the higher level, uh, what... Uh, in the, this is happening around the world now, is there is what is called as the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And so that is an, an umbrella that has brought together hundreds of cities across the globe into agreeing to on, uh, on certain issues on how cities should be investing in making food a permanent part of their urban development agenda. Usually when we say urban development, we talk about bridges and flyovers and metros and and other infrastructure. We never talk about food infrastructure, and that's what that particular pact has done. And many cities now in Asia have signed up for it. And so increasingly, we will see that in the in the urban development plans going ahead, cities will be making provision to ensure that there's more space available for urban agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Uh, one more question. Uh, I'd like to direct this to uh, the World Health Organization, WHO. We just already heard from UNICEF about overweight uh, children in, in urban areas and, and just in general. Uh, th but there's also other uh, non-communicable diseases that are increasing in urban areas, maybe due to the, the increasing population, but maybe for other reasons too. Uh, what are your recommendations to, to deal with uh, the, this issue of I guess it also is unhealthy diets, but that relates to these NCDs. Somebody from UNIS, uh, sorry, WHO, please. Yes, hi. Um, this you. is Angela De Silva from WHO Regional Office for Southeast Asia. So yeah, there's a strong link between unhealthy diets as well as other unhealthy risk behaviors and NCDs. And the focus we promote is to have an overall healthy diet, which includes the main components of nutrition, plus also low salt, sugar, and fat. Now, it's easier said than done to do this, and we have several um, action areas. One is, of course, consumer awareness and behaviors, where consumers need to be made aware. This Part of this is done through regulatory actions and the other part through sort of uh, things like food labeling, promoting regulations for restriction, restriction of trans fatty acids and things, basically to improve the whole food environment. On the other hand, the, the awareness of NCD risks and the management in the management part of NCD risks also. Sorry, I'm supposed to turn my camera on. Yeah. I hope you can hear me. So there are multi-pronged approaches being promoted. One, of course, the regulatory part, one population awareness, and the other one through the NCD management, and then again, the risk behaviors. Now, one of the biggest issues we face is when people have food under nutrition, um, food insecurity, it is pretty difficult for them to pick on, say, what, they, what we refer to as healthy diets. And you heard from the report that healthy diets tend to be very expensive. So governments, need to find a way to improve the urban food security and improve the access of people to uh, healthy diets. And this is one way in which the um, NCD agenda also can be met. And one more point that I would like to really highlight is the issue of commercial interests. So uh, for many of these regulatory efforts and trying to promote a healthy food environment, there are many commercial determinants which get in the way, and these need to be recognized. And uh, recently, WHO is also developing a um, um, conflict of interest guide, which countries can use to assess the commercial determinants and then take appropriate action against it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our audience for those questions. Um, it's uh, it, there. It was very good to to see so many uh, questions coming in. And again, thank you to our panelists. We didn't manage to respond to all the questions, but you can always contact our offices for any follow up.
Well, we all know good health starts with the food we eat. This is what we were just talking about. And good nutrition is our first defense against disease and our source of energy to live, thrive, and be active. An inadequate diet can perpetuate an inter uh, intergenerational cycle of malnutrition with severe consequences on both individuals and our member nations. To deliver a commentary on the findings of the SOFIA report 2022, from a health perspective, uh, Dr. Poonam uh, Ketrapal Singh, the WHO Regional Director for Southeast Asia, has sent this video message. Dr. Azusina Dayangirad, Assistant Secretary and Executive Director, National Nutrition Council, Department of Health, Philippines. Dr. Moil Doko, Chief of Staff to the President of Indonesia and Special Advisor on Food Security Related Issues for the President. Brigadier General Mohammed Zubaida Rahman, Chief Medical Officer, Dhaka North City Corporation, Bangladesh. Dr. Jong Jin Kim, FAO Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Asia and the Pacific. Dr. John Alif, Regional Director, WFP Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. Deborah Komeni, Regional Director, UNICEF. East Asia and Pacific Regional Office. Partners, colleagues and friends. My sincere gratitude for your insightful discussions and my thanks for the opportunity to address you today. Ending hunger, achieving food security and improving nutrition. This is our mission. Embedded in Sustainable Development Goal SDG 2, which is zero hunger and enshrined in SDG 3, that is good health and well-being. It is a mission that is central to the Southeast Asia region's flagship priorities on preventing and controlling com non-communicable diseases and on accelerating reductions of maternal, neonatal and undefined mortality. It is a mission that was central to last year's UN Food Systems Summit, which aimed to not just improve but transform food systems globally. And crucially, it is a mission on which we in Asia and the Pacific have made important life-changing progress. Between 2000 and 2021, stunting in children under five years of age was reduced from 38% to 23%. By 2021, the prevalence of undernourishment was 9.1%, a 5% reduction from 2000 and below the global average of 9.8%. Since the turn of the millennium, many countries in Asia and the Pacific have reduced the prevalence of low birth weight by three or more percentage points. And almost all countries have increased the prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding. These are commendable achievements for which countries and partners need to be rightfully proud. But let us be candid. They are achievements that are increasingly threatened, not least by the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and other geopolitical crisis, but also by inadequate progress in several key areas. For example, in 2021, the prevalence of severe food insecurity in Asia and the Pacific was 10.5%, up from 7% in 2014. Alarmingly, 
in southern Asia, severe food insecurity was estimated to be 21%, meaning that one in five people in the sub-region had gone a day or more without eating. Moreover, though stunting among children under five years of age has in recent years reduced, it nevertheless remains above the global average, as does the share of children under five who are affected by wasting. At the same time, between 2000 and 2020, Asia and the Pacific witness an increase in the proportion of children who are overweight from 4.2% to 5%, which in several sub-regions is even higher. Need it be said, if unaddressed, this trend will increase the region's rising tide of NCDs, exacerbating health, social, and economic costs. Today, I have four messages to help countries across Asia and the Pacific not just sustain but accelerate progress towards SDGs 2 and 3 on zero hunger and good health and well-being respectively. First, let us increase access to high-quality, disaggregated food systems data. Data that can inform city-level planning and which can prevent and respond to urban food security crisis. Second, let us scale up the delivery of essential nutrition actions with a focus on strengthening primary healthcare programs ensuring maximum coverage for maximum benefit. Third, let us develop, implement and strengthen key regulations and policies that enable healthy food environments and which actively reduce the triple burden of malnutrition, including overweight and obesity. And fourth, let us continue to advocate for and develop robust social protection programs that prevent and respond to national and global shocks, protecting the poorest and the most vulnerable, leaving no one behind. In these and other areas, I reiterate WHO's ongoing and unmitigated support to end hunger, to achieve food security, and to improve nutrition for everyone, everywhere, across Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we thank Dr. Singh for her commentary and her contribution today. Well, we're now approaching the end of this event, uh, once again, organized jointly by FAO, UNICEF, WFP, and uh, WHO for the Asia and the Pacific Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition 2022. But before we conclude, I'd like to invite the UNICEF Regional Director for East Asia and the Pacific, Ms. Deborah Kamini, to deliver closing remarks on behalf of all four of our UN agencies. Ms. Kamini, you have the floor. Thank you, Ada. Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, I am indeed very pleased to provide now the closing remarks on behalf of FAO, UNICEF, WP, and WHO. We are launching this report on food security and uh, nutrition at a very critical moment, a moment that shows that the improvements in food security and nutrition through the Asian Pacific region can no longer be taken for granted. A moment during which the ongoing multiple effects of COVID-19, of climate shocks, of conflicts, are putting access to sufficient food and in particular to healthy diets beyond the reach of millions of households, as we have heard in the presentations earlier today. 
this is threatening to increase malnutrition among children and other vulnerable groups for the years to come with the effects that are potentially devastating for the region. However, we also see that previous investments in nutrition can protect the progress achieved even in difficult circumstances, even through the pandemic. For example, the report shows that throughout Asia and the Pacific, reductions in childhood stunting, in low birth weight, and also improvements in breastfeeding have remained steady. The report did not stop at analyzing regional trends in food security and nutrition. It also put a spotlight on the diets of poor urban populations, a spotlight that is tiny given the rapid urbanization that we have heard about happening in Asia and the Pacific, as well as the rise in poverty and inequalities caused by the pandemic and subsequent shocks. Through this spotlight, the report shows that the opportunities offered by cities, abundant resources and strong infrastructures, the so-called urban advantage, are too often denied to the most vulnerable with far-reaching effects on food insecurity and malnutrition. Clearly, we must not leave unaddressed this burden of urban food insecurity and malnutrition, especially now when more and more families are seeking a better life in the cities of Asia and Pacific. It is so important that we as UN partners are able to share today the crucial insights emerging from the report to which we have contributed together. As UN partners, together we have also been able to support national actions to prevent and treat child wasting, a form of malnutrition that is linked to poor child survival and development in eight countries in the region, in the context of the Global Action Plan on Wasting. And to conclude, I would like to congratulate the governments of the Philippines and Indonesia and the city of Dhaka for all the actions highlighted in the panel discussion to improve food security and nutrition, including during the most critical phase of the pandemic in policy, in financing decisions at the national level, at the subnational level. This shows that progress is possible and it takes efforts, commitment, intentionality. Let us continue to be motivated by and build on these examples, on this commitment, and use the results presented today to inspire action for nutrition, safe, affordable, and sustainable diets everywhere, for all people throughout their lives, and to end malnutrition once and for all. We look forward to working with our partners to achieve this. And on behalf of FAO, UNICEF, WFP, WHO, I thank you for attending today's launch event and to continue this battle together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kamini, for sharing your observations and, and the way forward for our organizations. Well, as we've heard today uh, during the presentation of the main findings of this report, the situation is quite grim due to the increasing trends of nutritional deficiencies uh, and the struggle for so many to access healthy diets, which continues, unfortunately. We know that more recently, this has been driven by the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, economic and environmental crises. Yet amidst the gloom, there's always hope. So today's event has been a clarion call to action for urgent coordinated efforts by member nations, development partners, civil society, the private sector and all of us to improve the status of food security and nutrition in the Asia Pacific region. As mentioned, if you wish to obtain a PDF copy of the report, you may contact FAO by sending an email to my colleague uh, whose email address is there on the screen. The full report will be available online in the coming days and a Chinese version will be following uh, shortly thereafter. So once again, thank you to our speakers, our panelists, and all of you who've joined virtually for this launch. Until our next meeting, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>